Thanks for having me back, Keith, and thanks for everybody for having me back. Um, so uh, the session is going to be about dynamic frequency selection. I know Keith told us not to introduce ourselves, but that's me, and that's my Twitter address. So I'm always looking for new followers. And I'm uh, CWNE number four and director of product marketing at Extreme Networks. I'm also the co-author of this big fat book right here that some of you might be familiar with. Um, and uh, very proud of this book and um, met a lot of people in the industry because of the book, uh, including I made some new friends from Russia uh, last night, um, so specifically for this book. So I'm very, very flattered about all the people that have purchased the book over the years. And we always have a little tradition here um, and at all these conferences. And uh, there's my co-author, David Westcott. I always like to give him a shout out, but for uh, it, most of you guys are never going to meet him because he never shows up to any of these conferences. That's why we troll him at every conference on Twitter um, with uh, uh, the where, where is Westcott hashtag. So uh, please, if you get, got a quick second, take a picture of that and tweet it out. So um, let's go ahead and get into it um, because I got 50 minutes. And uh, the topic, once again, is dynamic frequency selection. But it's related to um, a lot of things. And I want to start off uh, just talking about channel reuse patterns. And so, you know, we all know that the primary goal of channel reuse patterns mainly is to prevent co-channel interference. Sometimes it's referred to as OBSS, overlapping basic service sets, but I prefer the term co-channel interference, and sometimes we call it co-channel um, cooperation, because it's actually Wi-Fi working the way it's supposed to work. But um, the problem with it is uh, if you have channels or devices on the same channels, only one can transmit at a time. All you guys know this, and um, it consumes airtime. So the whole point of a channel reuse uh, pattern is to uh, reduce airtime consumption by isolating the frequency domains, which is just a fancy name for channels. And we all know that RF doesn't stop, and it's almost impossible to prevent co-channel interference in the 2.4 band because there's only three usable channels. And the bigger problem is that CCI is stat not static, it's always changing, and um, clients are the number one cause of uh, co-channel interference. So in the 2.4 band, uh, unless you have uh, you know, solid iron walls, steel walls, and uh, AP is very far away, you just can't prevent it. It's just a fact of life. You're going to deal with it. But at 5 gigahertz, it's a little bit different. Um, one of the things that you can do at 5 gigahertz is if you use a whole boatload of channels is that you can effectively prevent CCI. So if you notice right here, and we have all the European channels right here, you have channel 36 right here and then over here. So if you start to factor in walls, and attenuation and, sp and spatial distance, even with clients um, communicating and being the number one cause of co-channel interference, you can pretty much prevent it if you start to factor in wall attenuation and, and if you use all the channels, which is why um, I'm kind of leading into why it's important to use the DFS channels. So in most cases, you should use the dynamic frequency selection channels simply because if the more channels you have in a five gigahertz channel reuse pattern, the less eyes you'll have of CCI, meaning you'll have a better performing wireless LAN. Now, what is DFS? So I'm, hopefully most everybody in this room knows this, but the DFS channels are these ones highlighted in yellow right here. It's in the Uni 2A band and the Uni 2C bands right here. And it's all these channels right here. And it's all about radar avoidance. And so that your Wi-Fi, whether it's enterprise or home Wi-Fi, doesn't interfere um, with ra uh, weather radar and military radar and, um, because they get upset when uh, Wi-Fi interferes with radar. And there's actually some historical information about that I'm going to cover. Um, and the whole point of DFS capabilities is that you be able to uh, detect radar pulses and avoid it by moving to a different channel. And we're going to get into that and talk about that in detail at how it works, as well as do, do a little demo. Now, the rules 
on how you can transmit on these channels, they're going to differ um, from country to country. Uh, there's a pretty set, solid, set rules in the United States, and there's a pretty set rules in, in Europe as well. But they, they even they differ sometimes from country to country, and also in in Asia as well. But they're, for the most part, they're they're pretty similar. But the rules on how you can transmit in these channels, as well as avoid interference, uh, may differ from country to country. I, I want to point out this bullet right here. Please note that DFS requirements aren't just for Wi-Fi. So remember, the 5 gigahertz band is what kind of band? It's an unlicensed frequency band, right? Meaning that anybody can transmit in it. Um, they still have to abide by rules. Uh, so uh, other things, other than Wi-Fi, can also transmit in the 5 gigahertz band. And same thing, they're not allowed to interfere with radar. Okay. So uh, how did all this get started? Well, it actually got started in Europe, to tell the truth, like the ERC, the uh, European Regulatory Committee, uh, and with the SC regulations, kind of got some of the DFS regulations started uh, uh, 20 plus years ago. And uh, the FCC in the United States actually followed later on. Uh, usually, you know, all the regulatory bodies, um, there's a consortium of them, they're, they're different in each country, but they all talk to each other. And usually things actually get started in the United States, but then they're talking to the Europeans and the Asians, and then they usually come a little bit later. But this time it was the other way around. It actually kind of got started in Europe uh, first. But uh, and there's a perfect example of what we're going to see with that uh, next. Is I don't know if anybody's speaking about six gigahertz this week, but six gigahertz is coming, and it's coming fast. It's coming. You're going to see it in the United States first, and then you're going to see it uh, here in Europe. But it is it is coming. Uh, but uh, same thing. Uh, just followed a little bit different. Path. Path. Um, and then the IEEE, which we all know makes the standards, decided to come up with defined mechanisms on how Wi-Fi radios would deal with radar avoidance and also avoiding some other types of communications. And the two methods were defined, were originally defined all the way back in 2003 for um, the amendment called 802.11h, and it defined two mechanisms, dynamic frequency selection, which is going to be our main topic, and also transmit power control. So let's just talk a little bit about transmit power control. The initial intent of transmit power control was to protect against the Earth expo exploration satellite services. Okay, And the way uh, TPC works in the 5 gigahertz band, simply this, is the AP tells the client radios to power down with the AP and to, with a hope that they won't interfere with these type of services. Now, um, you don't really see TPPC used for this method, uh, for this purpose, uh, that much. It is actually still a requirement, but it's mostly for outdoor uh, communications. Uh, you don't really see it required for indoor communications. Uh, that being said, TPC is like one of these mechanisms that came out of, uh, that's used for other things now. Um, so even though it was meant as an avoidance to uh, avoid interfering with satellite communications, we now use it quite a bit in both the 5 gigahertz and the 2.4 gigahertz band to get a, ma a radio, ba uh, a balanced link between the APs and the clients. And that's another great way to reduce airtime consumption caused by uh, channel co client channel channel coach co-channel interference, get the words up the sooner or later. Um, so TPC is actually um, a wonderful thing for other reasons. Just be aware that sometimes uh, TPC can cause problems. I'm sure a lot of you might have seen this. You enable it and some old legacy clients just kind of crap out because they can't handle the uh, IE that's in the beacon frames from the APs. But if you have a newer clients, it's actually usually a good thing. So let's talk about DFS. So once again, in Europe, um, you guys are pretty lucky because when your APs get certified, um, the same time that they get certified to transmit in the five gigahertz band, they also get certified for DFS. So when a vendor comes out with a brand new, when Extreme Networks comes out with their next AP, okay, and releases it in Europe, guess what? You can immediately start using the DFS channels. Not so much 
in the United States. The United States is a little bit different. There's two rounds of certification. We have to get certified first um, just to abide by the power uh, and channel regulations, uh, just to even have the capability to transmit in five gigahertz. But there's a whole set of rules and a different certification process for DFS. And there's like a th uh, anywhere from a three to six month backlog to get that secondary certification. So why is that a problem? Well, that causes us problems in the United States because we release a new AP and uh, we'll have a customer buy thousands of them and they deploy them initially, but only with these nine channels right here, the Uni 1 and uh, the Uni 3, band, uh, Uni 3 bands um, and none of the DFS radios. So you know what ends up happening? Um, with a lot in the United States, you never see the DFS channels deployed in the United States because customers that bought the brand new APs before the DFS certification never bothered to go back and re redesign a channel plan using the DFS channels once the, they became DFS certified and new firmware uh, came out. This is a huge problem in the United States. You don't have it so much over here, but we r uh, run into this all the time. Customers buy brand new APs and then boom, they don't have it. Um, this is also a stupid way on how vendors will, in the United States, try to compete against each other sometimes. They'll say, hey, uh, that, that vendor, vendor X over here, they don't support the DFS channels. Yeah, they do, just not yet. They haven't got certified. So if a vendor ever tries to lay that crap on you, it's just nonsense. Uh, it'll, they'll get certified eventually. Now, there is some legacy APs that may not be DFS certified, especially in the United States, so we'll talk about that. So why is this puppy so sad? Okay, um, it's another sad puppy tail in the United States. Okay, so right about when 802.11n debuted in 2009, uh, the FCC actually suspended DFS certification for, I don't know, it was like two or three years, I think. And it was right about the same time I was going to work for Aerohive and when 802.11 in APs came out and we couldn't get our APs certified for DFS. And I'm not gonna get into the whole story, whole story but it was one naughty vendor that had an outdoor AP uh, that uh, interfered, uh, uh, was near an airport or military base. I don't remember the full story, but basically it, pissed off the FAA, pissed off the FCC, and at the end of the day, they just said, that's it, we're not certifying any more APs, so and we're gonna take another look at this. So what the situation that ended up happening was that we had some old 802.11a APs that were DFS certified and some A clients, but none of the new N APs and clients that came out for about three years in the United States couldn't use the DFS channels. Um, unless we cheated and we put European firmware on them, but that, that was illegal. Um, now, um, so as a result, still to this day, um, there's a lot of client devices that might still be hanging around. Uh, unfortunately, clients have a way of hanging around longer than they're supposed to. But th during that period, um, those client devices, the, the client vendor said, screw it, we're not going to even bother to get uh, these to match because the APs aren't getting certified. So we're not even going to put it in our firmware to support the DFS channels. So every now and then, you'll still run into some legacy clients that don't support DFS channels. Not much of a problem anymore. Don't see it that often anymore, but some are still out there. Um, so let's get into some of the defined mechanisms. And some of these uh, are based on both FCC and ETSI regulations. Um, and they're very similar, but you'll see a few differences. Um, so bottom line is there has to be a master device and a client device. So what is the master device? The master device is usually an AP. I guess it could be a controller, but it's an AP that uh, um, it could be a controller in Europe that works with multiple APs, but it's an AP and it does the radar detection. Okay, and it's basically in charge of how uh, dynamic frequency selection mechanisms work. Um, DFS certification is required for master devices. So pretty much all APs have to get certified in Europe and the rest of the world. The client device is gonna be your Wi-Fi clients. Uh, they don't necessarily require uh, the same type of DFS level certification, but, but basically they, don't, they can do radar detection. We'll talk about that in a minute, but they're not required to do radar detection and they don't function as the master device, uh, which doing what is called channel switch announcement. 
campus, you're going to see that, uh, except in one uh, different case in ad hoc communications. So if you're doing ad hoc, they have to still be able to detect for, for DFS as well. Um, Bottom line is the master device, the AP, can actually is controls clients, which is kind of an exception to the rule with the way we're used to Wi-Fi working. So a couple of definitions here. Uh, one is known as the channel availability check, and that is just a function that monitors for different uh, radar waveforms. Now, DFS actually looks like, I think, at six of them. Okay, there's six different types of radar pulses. Um, there's actually uh, more. There's a, a seventh one as well, but uh, DFS is not required to look at that one, and I'm actually going to talk about that in a minute, why that could be a problem. This is some very expensive uh, testing equipment that tests this APs. Um, There's a screenshot from some uh, very expensive equipment that does testing of APs on whether or not they support DFS. Um, and basically, the channel availment check time is a period of time when the APs must actually listen for these six different kinds of radar pulses. Now, it's based on a DFS detection threshold. And this is straight out of the FCC documentation. I think the numbers are very similar in Europe, but you can see the thresholds are based on different, uh, different outdoor or uh, indoor capabilities. Um, they're pretty high thresholds, okay? But um, bottom line is, if you detect uh, something uh, above the radar pulse above those thresholds, you're gonna find out that you are not allowed to transmit on those channels and you have to move, okay? Um, so. This is once again uh, a document uh, out of the FCC documentation, and I also gave you a link that uh, actually describes all these pulses and the different uh, certification requirements in the various co countries. You'll see that link later in the presentation. But you can see that there's six radar waveforms, that, uh, types that are issued for uh, DFS certification. Um, there's five that do short pulses and one that does a, lo a long pulse. And then when they do the actual certification, there's a minimum percentage of successful detection uh, for, and once again, based on that threshold, but uh, of successful detection. So you can see in most cases, they need to be able to detect the radar in, uh, they do multiple rounds of testing and they need to be able to detect it at least 60% of the time. And, uh, and it's based on a number of repetitive tests. Okay, once again, uh, in the United States, there's like a six month backlog for this. And by the way, this is very expensive. Your wireless LAN vendors pay a lot of money to have this done, okay? Um, it's a government shakedown. Um, and a testing, it varies uh, 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 region to region, as we talked about. So let's actually look at a radar web, uh, webform right here. So I got a little spectrum analyzer capture right here. And you can see a channel right here, and just wait for it. In just a minute, you're gonna see a radar pulse and see what happens to the, this is on a DFS channel, and see what happens. There's the pulse, boom. What happened to the channel? Let's just look at that one more time, so if you didn't catch it the first time. So here we go, we have a channel transmitting, and then we'll see a radar pulse in just a second. I believe this is a little short burst, and there it is. But you notice the Wi-Fi channel disappeared. That's because it had to move to a different channel. Now, it's probably hard to see, but you're gonna see this in later slides. I have um, what you're seeing right there. This is the, um, the frame exchange that goes on between the master device and the client devices that basically tell AP telling the clients they have to move, okay? And that's what we're gonna get into next. It's called, um, at the, during the, the actual listening, um, let's talk about the initial channel availability check. So when an AP boots up, the first thing that has to happen is you have to listen first, is listen before you talk, on the DFS channels. But the rules require an AP, the master device, to listen for 60 seconds. In other words, an AP cannot start beaconing for 60 seconds until um, it knows that that channel is clear and null of any radar burst. Now once there's 60 seconds of, of a clear channel, then the AP will start beaconing. Now clients are a little bit different um, because they're not the master device, but they're not allowed to send out probe request frames. Okay, um, so how do clients start communicating on one of the DFS channels? Well, it's basically if they assume that the channel is clear, um, 
if they hear an AP. If they hear an AP beaconing, or they hear a probe response, well, actually, they won't hear a probe response, but if they hear a beacon um, when they're doing passive scanning, they know, hey, the AP's already evaluated this DFS channel. It's OK. I can tra transmit, and then they'll start sending things like association requests and try to have a party with the AP and get connected. Now, it is a little bit different on, in, here in Europe for these three channels right here, the terminal Doppler weather radar uh, channels, 120, 124, and 128. Uh, did I say that right? Yeah, those three channels. You have to listen, an AP has to listen for 10 full minutes before they can transmit. So I'll never forget this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had an AP, and I forgot that I had European country code on it. And, um, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I put it on channel 124. And I put it a static channel, and it, I had it on, the, light, the lights were green, everything was great, and no beacons, and I was getting really mad. I'm like, God, this new stupid firmware, and I was really mad, and finally I figured it out, I went, oh, the rules are different. And I figured out that I had European country code, but it was basically the AP was operating the way it was supposed to work. It was not allowed to transmit for 10 full minutes. Now, if APs and clients are already operating on that channel, uh, once, so once they've done the availability check, okay, whether it's 10 minutes or 60 seconds, then they can start uh, uh, transmitting on the channel. Now, that's when they have to start listening for, um, still continue to listen for radar pulses and they're uh, constantly scanning. And if they do hear a radar pulse, what the AP is gonna do is he's going to send what's called a channel switch announcement frame to tell the AP to move. Now, um, there's a certain amount of time for where this can occur, and that is uh, defined as 10 seconds. Now, what you're gonna see here in a minute, this usually happens in under a second. Okay, it's the AP just saying, guys, there's radar here, we gotta go. We gotta move to a different channel because we're not allowed to, to interfere. Now, you'll see this varies. Uh, very often, it'll go to channel 36 or a non-DFS channel, but not always. You'll see that this varies from AP to AP and situation to situation, and it can vary, and we'll get into that in just a minute. So what do the channel switch announcements look like? So they can actually be in three frames. So the three types of frames that can be used by an AP to tell the clients you gotta move are uh, the beacon frame, the probe response frame, and the action frame. Uh, and, and most of you know an action frame is basically a frame that can do anything. And one of the things that can uh, function as is the channel switch announcement. And that is the channel switch announcement information element. And there's three main components to it. One is the, um, uh, and and this, this actually right here is a screen capture of really a really good, perfect uh, CSA exchange. And we're going to look at multiple ones here in a minute. But you actually see uh, two action frames that are used and then another seven beacon frames that are used to continue to tell the clients we got to move. So why are they using multiple frames to do this? Well, think about this. What if there's a bunch of clients out there and they don't hear that first action frame, or that action frame got, gets corrupted, okay? And then what if everybody just jumped? The AP just left. Well, then you still got clients that are all of a sudden will be probing in that channel and now they're violating the regulations, okay? So um, once again, this exchange happens in less than a second and they have 10 seconds to do the move, but you can see right here, um, you're basically guaranteeing that the client's gonna hear, hopefully hear one of these and all the clients will jump to the other channel and not interfere with the radar. So uh, let's take a look at some of the information. So in the channel switch announcement, in this case, you're, you can actually see it saying, let's move from channel 64 to channel 40. And that's basically, you can actually see that right here saying, okay, we're all gonna move from 64 and we're all gonna move to channel 40, okay? Um, and, now, and once again, um, and then there's also something called the channel switch mode. The announcement is mode. And that's what this field is right here. And almost always you'll see this as mode number one. So what does that mean? That is the AP saying, not only are we going to move to a different channel, but you have to stop transmitting now. Even though we're not going to move for like maybe seven or eight more beacons, you have to stop transmitting now. So it's basically a way for the AP says, I might still transmit for a little bit longer and we're going to move in a, a certain amount of beacon, uh, uh, um, certain amount of number of beacons, but shut up. Everybody shut up. And that's what that, that feels for right there. 
Uh, and then the switch count, so is the number of targeted beacon times to basically tell when the channel jump is gonna occur. So in this case, it's saying, we're gonna jump in like eight TBTTs. And then if, once it goes down to a value of one, once it counts down to a value of one, it basically says in, the, in 100 milliseconds later, one or two milliseconds later, or microseconds, excuse me, microseconds later, we're all going to jump to the other channel. Okay, so it's basically three things. What channel we're gonna jump to, a mode that says all you clients be quiet, and then it's a countdown to, to the jump. Okay. Now, um, there's also something called in-service monitoring, and surprisingly, a lot of clients do do this, and that is that clients can also uh, detect radar, um, but they are not the ones that are initiating the jump. They might report the radar detection up to an AP. So a client might be further away um, at a, a distance from the AP from the other clients, but it can still communicate with the uh, AP. Maybe the AP didn't hear the radar, but the client did. It'll send like an action frame up to the AP saying, hey, I heard radar, and the a AP is going to go, uh-oh, there's radar, and then he'll tell all the clients, it's time to go. Okay, um, there's also something that is defined in Europe, and I haven't been able to wrap my head around and whether or not we can do this in the United States yet, but in Europe, uh, it defines an optional method for off-channel detection of um, radar. So maybe uh, I'm an AP and uh, this off-channel CAC time, I'm an AP and I'm on channel 64, but you know all APs do off-channel scanning and they do it for their own uh, uh, vendor reasons for um, RRM purposes, but they could also do part-time uh, non-continuous DFS monitoring. And it's a little bit different for channels 120 through 124 Four, um, and by the way, this is optional. Um, you have a period of one to 24 hours where you can still do the evaluation of other channels, even though you're already on a DFS channel. Okay, and then you can also do it. It's a little bit less. It's six minutes to four hours that you can do this off-channel DFS monitoring. And the whole purpose of this is, is that you know what? I did this off-channel monitoring, um, and that might make it easier. Even though if I have to move, I can move when I do my jump. I can jump to another DFS channel. Okay, and that's the purpose of this. Now, um, once an AP and client switch to a non-DFS channel, uh, they can't return to the previous DFS channel for 30 minutes. That's known as the non-occupancy time. And typically you will see that, um, that uh, after, you know, they'll move to say like channel 36, but then they have to stay there for 30 minutes before they can go back to their original DFS channel or possibly another DFS channel. Um, now, um, now Broadcom, is uh, came up with something called zero weight DFS. Um, there, and what this is about is one of the problems when you're back on the, uh, uh, the channel that you've jumped to is if you're gonna jump back to a DFS channel, you have to uh, evaluate for 60 seconds again. So the problem with that is if the AP has to go back to a DFS channel to, go, to listen again, um, it may not be servicing clients. So Broadcom came up with something called zero weight DFS that takes advantage of the multiple radio change in MIMO radios. And basically, if I'm a three by three AP, I might be on channel 36, but then I could go, thank you, sir. Um, but, but then I could go listen on channel 100 with one of my radio channels. And then if it's free, then I can jump back to channel 100. And that way I can continue to monitor, uh, excuse me, service my clients back on the non-DFS channel without interrupting service. But that is a Broadcom specific feature. Um, okay, now let's talk about problems with DFS and then we'll kind of get into some cool stuff. So I got about 26 minutes left here. Um, the biggest problem with DFS what? And I think most of you know this, it's false positives. And it has been for a long time. Um, so in other words, a bird flaps its wings um, and it's detected as a radar event and then everybody um, jumps to a, a different channel. And historically, this has been the biggest problem with DFS, especially in the early days, back in when 802.11a and even to a certain extent in, uh, false positives, uh, they were, it was just horrible. Now, they still exist. 
and it still it still happens. And uh, vendors are always tweaking things a little bit uh, so that false positives don't occur. But don't kid yourself, they will still occur every now and then. Um, not near as bad as it used to be, though. Okay. Um, and there's our sad puppy again, because it's not just false positive. So there's other problems. So um, I'm just going to be honest here. Um, a lot of vendors have had some serious problems, including the one that I worked for for uh, 11 years, Arrowhive. About five years ago, we had all kinds of DFS problems. Uh, and where we found most of them was in the Netherlands. Because in the Netherlands, there's all the shipyards, and um, guess what's there? And all the there's radar. And we were finding all kinds of problems, and a lot of it had to do simply, even though we were passing DFS certification, we, a lot of our implementation was messed up. So number one, I mentioned that there's, a, you have to, you're required to detect six types of pulses. Well, we were detecting seven including one that's not required for DFS certification. And we were detecting at ri these ridiculous thresholds too. So once again, if a bird flew through the air, we would think that it was, um, um, <clears throat> we were too sensitive for radar detection and uh, we jump. And we didn't have to jump even if there wasn't uh, radar in the area. Another problem that we used to see, and by the way, the problems I'm describing other vendors have had as well, um, is, all the APs would jump to the same channel. And usually channel 36, seen a lot of vendors have this problem. They all just jump to the same channel. So you have 10 APs in D various DFS channels and they all jump to 36. Okay, and that's no good. And then you have, then you have uh, a new contention problem because they're all in the same channel. And then there was a third problem we used to see, they would never go back. <laughs> So they just stay on channel 36, and then this is a problem in general if an AP jumps to different channels, if vendors have their RRM mechanisms in place, it might affect the other APs, and they might start changing, okay? So there's a whole host of problems that can happen with DFS from the various vendors, okay? Now, vendor improvements have gotten better, or have they? Yes, they have, but there'll be some issues. So why is this puppy so happy? Because it's demo time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So give me just one second. Get a little toy out here. Okay. Yeah, well, I haven't seen it yet. So, All right. So I have an AP on channel 60. Okay. Okay. There's the AP on channel 60. Everybody see that? It's on channel 60. And I am going to start an air tool capture on channel 60 in just a second. All right, and I have a little toy here. I'll talk about the toy in just a minute. And I'm gonna start my capture. And here we go. Okay, maybe I don't have too close. Oh, uh, don't you love it when demos fail? Uh, I think it worked. Let's see. Give me one second. Did not, ah, yeah, it did. It jumped. See how it jumped to a channel 100? So it jumped actually to another D. Yeah, it was just, it was, uh, I have to, it's a manual refresh. But I did not capture, get the screen capture. So give me one second. <coughs> I'm trying to see if I got the channel, the capture I wanted. <coughs> All right, I'll tell you what, we'll try it one more time, and if not, but you saw the, chan the AP jump. It's an AP in the back of the room, it's right next it's, uh, to, um, to Ben back there, okay? Um, and we jump from channel 60 to channel 100. So let's try it one more time, and if not, I'll just move on, because demos never seem to work when you're having fun here. All right, and give me a minute just to adjust my little toy here.
Okay, and I'm starting the air capture. Oh, well, that's funny. Maybe, see if it stops. Maybe I'm just not close enough. We've got too many bodies in the room. Yeah, it just stopped. I just, I have it on low power too. I don't have it on high power. And I'm gonna explain what this is in just a second. Okay, now let's see if we can see this in the channel and the capture, but we'll do a refresh here real quick. And it went to channel 52. Everybody see that? Went to channel 52. Now, I'm gonna do a little filter, looking for an action frame. Oops, try that again. Looking for action frame. Oh, man, we're seeing a lot of action frames. That's kind of weird. There it is, 52 action frames. Ah, there you go, okay. So let's start right there. So we got a noisy environment here. We're capturing a lot of stuff, but there's an action frame right there. And you can actually see if you open it up and I'll blow up this screen in a second. You can actually see right there that it's saying we're gonna jump to channel 52 and we have a, a channel jump count of eight. And we also see that the channel announcement mode was one. So there was actually about eight of you that were connected to this. I guarantee if you check, probably all of you are connected that were connected to this. I had two devices connected to it, but I saw about six other devices connect to. You're probably in channel 52 right now, okay? If you wanted to check. Now, um, you can actually see, see now there's another beacon. So there's a lot of traffic, but you see all the beacons. There's number six, number five, and so on and so on. Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about what we just did. Okay. So what was this little magical toy that David was holding in his hand? Well, it's the Wi-Fi Matrix Channel Analyzer. And some of you may have seen this before because it's been presented uh, by the company Nuts About Nets uh, before. And it's a toy that has a lot of things in it. It's had the air horn signal generator. It also has uh, another analysis tool called Wi-Fi Probe, okay? But this is a prototype, what I'm holding in my hand, because now it has this. It has a radar simulator in it. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so now some of you um, have played with RF, uh, RF hack before, and I think it's even been done at this, uh, hack RF, excuse me, done it at, at this conference where you, you know, a bunch of geeks got in one of these uh, sidebar sessions and were able to get uh, hack RF to do some uh, radar pulses. Well, the cool thing about this is what they've done, and they'll be making this available for sale soon, is they've made it available. Um, when, when it goes for sale for all six radar waveforms, okay, and you just push a button and um, you can choose uh, between any of the DFS channels. You can uh, choose the six different radar uh, waveform types. Um, you can, uh, has a low and high power. And you can also just be on that one radar pulse type or you can have the little box uh, traverse uh, through all six types while you're doing that, which is what I was doing just a minute ago. I had it on low power and it was just going through the six different pulses. And as soon as the AP heard it, um, I think we're having a little of a attenuation with the bodies of the room. As soon as they got a little bit closer, it heard it, boom, and it worked, okay? So it's uh, wifimetrics.com, um, and it's brought to you by our friends at Nuts About Nets, okay? Uh, it is a prototype. It's not for sale yet. Yeah, um, they'll, they'll be making announcements, but I got with them last week. I actually got to them with the first uh, time with them back in last March and got with them uh, last week again, and they were kind enough to lend me this to bring here to show to all you guys today. So, and if anybody wants to come and take a look at it um, uh, during the off sessions, I'll be happy to do this. So I'm going to show you a few examples. Yes. I knew you were going to ask that, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> so Keith asked me the same thing last night, and I got to find out. So I'll try to find out, and uh, and when I when I get the answer, Keith will tell somebody later in the conference. So when I get his answer, we'll tell. Okay. So I, I just don't I, I don't know. Um, so we'll, because some of you might already own one. So I got it. 
okay? Um, okay, so let's proceed. So I have a few examples here. So uh, uh, me and the guys from Nuts.net, and another guy you, some of you might know, Devin, uh, uh, went to the Bat Cave and did a bunch of uh, uh, testing with various vendor APs. Now I'm not gonna call out the vendors, um, but you can probably figure it out by the OUI addresses. But uh, that being said, um, this is not to pick on any vendor or anything, it's just to show you that every vendor kind of does it differently. And, um, and I'll draw some conclusions from this. So this is um, actually a good example right here. You actually see two action frames, okay? And you see the count start, and the count started with, and it's using uh, six beacons before the jump, and it counts off six beacons. And once again, it's telling everybody, you know what, don't transmit. Be quiet until we jump. And in this case, they're jumping to channel 149 and a non-DFS. And the clients did follow. So that's the other thing I tested too, is the clients follow. Now what I didn't test in each case is wait for 30 minutes to see if they go back, but I tested that on a couple APs, and in almost all cases, in the, after 30 minutes, they would go back, okay? As long as the channel was still clear. Um, vendor B here, um, I did like three different tests, and on all three different tests, they didn't use any action frames, okay, at all. They just used uh, beacons, and they used three beacons to indicate um, that the channel switch announcement. And in this case, it was uh, no action frames, three beacons. They told them to be quiet, but then they jumped. So, and then in this case, they jumped to a D, uh, to uh, actually that's a, a, a non DFS channel, um, but uh, it was a quick jump. So this vendor says, "Let's just go. Let's go fast." In most cases, you're going to see it happens in under a second, because do the math. You know, you know, ten beacons is about a second, right? So, but they have ten seconds to do the jump. So. Um, uh, this is vendor B, basically the same thing. Um, so here's another example. Um, in this case, the, the vendor said, you know what, I have two action frames, and then my count is eight, meaning we're gonna jump in eight beacons, but then it stopped beaconing, okay? And it did this every time. So after two beacons, it didn't do the, the remaining six beacons. So. I had no way of testing, did it jump after the seventh beacon or did it wait for everybody to leave? I, it's just, this is how the vendor does it. There's nothing necessarily wrong with this, but once again, the only problem I have with that is if it only, you're increasing your odds of maybe it not hearing the channel switch announcement, okay? Um, but the clients followed, it worked, okay? Uh, in this example, um, this is really bad. Look what they, um, look, well, I, I don't like this at all. Um, so this is bad right here. The client switch mode was zero. So during the channel switch move time, you know, before they actually do the move, the clients could theoretically still transmit. And I believe that is optional, but in most cases, almost every vendor had this value of one, telling the clients to be quiet, but not this vendor. And look what they did. The clients, there's no action frames. Well, there is one action frame, but then the beacons, but then there was no switch count. They did count off eight beacons, but with every beacon, it had a switch count of zero. So they were basically the AP eight times saying, move, move, move. Now, what's the problem with that? Does anybody see a problem with that? Get the AP's not over there yet. So the clients might jump in this case before the AP go, uh, goes over there. And that was a different vendor that did that. And, um, and that also seemed to always go to, and this particular vendor always seemed to go to the same channel too. It always seemed to go to channel 40. Most vendors that we tested seemed to jump around between uh, various channels, okay? Um, so here's our sad puppy again. And why is he so sad? Uh, vendor AP uh, model number three here, vendor C, unresponsive to radar signatures at both low and high power levels. We tested this multiple times. Now, you know what? You're gonna see some vendors, uh, a lot of vendors have this problem, especially if they're uh, uh, AP, older APs. So I'm just gonna be honest here. Uh, uh, Arrowhive had a bunch of AC APs, um, are actually in APs, a bunch of 802.11 NAPs, and then the FCC changed the DFS regulations in 2016. So you know what that meant, didn't you? If we were gonna continue to uh, transmit on DFS with new firmware, 
we had to resubmit for certification. So we made a very tactical and economical decision. We did not get those APs recertified. Now, you could still use the old firmware. If you use the old firmware for those APs, they were still certified. But if you upgraded the new firmware, these older APs, that were you. Um, um, they were no longer certified, and we removed the capability with the newer firmware for those older APs to even transmit. In this case, the AP was uh, available to configure. Most APs are not even should be configurable for the DFS channels if they're not certified. This AP was certified, but it didn't work. So that's not a good thing. Um, and then look at this one. Okay, so here's a vendor that had old firm, using old firmware. We saw two action frames. Channel switch mode was one. The count was 10, but 10 beacon, and 10 beacons for the jump, but look what it did. It moved from channel 52 to channel 100, okay? And it went from a 20 megahertz channel to an 80 megahertz channel. Woo! Okay, so um, that wasn't a happy day. And it was a competitor, and we, we called them up, and, and the vendor confirmed it, um, uh, confirmed it, and it had to do with their default 80 megahertz settings and their RRM algorithm, okay? Um, so their RRM actually caused problems with the DFS, because seriously, do you really want an AP to move from a 20 megahertz to an 80 megahertz? Not good, okay? So we actually saw that happen. Now, to the vendor's credit, they fixed it, okay? Uh, uh, about six months later, they had new firmware, and we did a different test, and guess what? It worked just fine. So to the vendor's credit, uh, six months later, and it might have had something to do with the fact that we um, said something to them, um, they fixed it. So, um, and look, there's no shame in that. I already admitted to you that Arrowhive had problems with this five years ago. So every vendor's had their own uh, issues with it, but they, gotta, they need to fix things. Um, in, most cases, in most cases, the clients will follow. Now, one thing I will say this, and what is one thing that we've learned about clients over years? They kind of have a mind of their own, okay? Now, they're supposed to abide by DFS regulations, and if they hear a channel switch announcement, they're supposed to go but we didn't always see that. In most cases we did, but in some cases we saw clients just want to roam, you know, and uh, might roam to another AP. Um, so you might see that occasionally. So let's make some observations of some of the things I've shown you. So number one, vendors implement channel switch announcements uh, differently. We just, I just showed you five or six different ways, and they, they all do it differently. Doesn't mean one way is right or wrong. I think some do it better than others. I tend to think if there's eight or 10 uh, uh, beacons, I think that's better. Because um, you give them a full second to make sure that all the clients here, and then let's jump. If you have 10 seconds to jump, I, I don't, what I don't like is the ones that say, let's all go now because you couldn't miss a message. Um, but they all do it differently, some better than others. Uh, guess what? Within one vendor, you will see different yields and different results with different AP models. You will see that, okay? And multiple vendors prove this, not just one vendor. With different AP models, you'll see different um, things. And uh, different AP models from the same vendor may perform differently, I wish I just said that and changes in firmware. And we also just saw a positive change in firmware, but you might also see a negative change in DFS channel switch announcement behavior when there's firmware updates, which is kind of interesting, which because think about it, the vendors get their AP certified by the FCC and here in Europe as well, but then they do firmware updates and Technically, maybe all of a sudden something they do and, you know, hopefully it's still abiding by the rules and the regulations, but eh, maybe not, okay? So be aware of that. Um, so everybody likes this site, right? Mike's in the room somewhere. Um, but yeah, he's in here. Where's Mike? Well, okay, he's setting up his lab, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna come to his presentation. Now, um, <laughs> Yeah. By the way, but this is everybody that's participated in this loves this site because it's a way that uh, the community started participating and sharing information. Well, guess what? There's a new one. It's called Announcing the DFS Project. 
um, and it's called thedfsproject.com. Um, and this, and you can all um, take a quick picture of that, but it's, you can go ahead and add it to your browser as well. And it's hosted by the Nuts About Nets people. And there's going to be a call to action for you guys to start participating in this, um, obviously, and start sharing information about what you're seeing with different clients and APs in terms of DFS behavior. Um, now, to, to do what I did here, um, some of the tools that you can do, use to do this is, number one, uh, you need to get one of these when they become available. Or you could use HackRF if you want to, if you like to play with toys. Um, but this thing, uh, once it becomes available, will have all, all the simulations ready, and it's just a push of a button. Um, AirTool is great to capture, um, and you need a MacBook, so if you're using Windows, it's time to buy a MacBook. Um, and use Adrian's AirTool to do the capture. Obviously, you need Wireshark. And use this filter right here. If you use this filter to uh, capture on the action frame, um, what you can then do is take yourself straight to the process on the action frame. And the other thing I, I, I uh, think you should uh, require you to do in Wireshark is uh, create a custom column for the channel switch announcement count, which is another thing I, I did. Um, anybody here going to Eddie's session today? Uh -huh. Okay, all right. Well, he's, uh, I'm going. So I'm going to Eddie's uh, session on Wireshark, looking very forward about it, pick up some new uh, Wireshark skills. Um, but filters are your friend, okay? Um, and, you know, Spectrum Analyzer is cool, too. So you can, um, um, now, a couple more things, because i got about five minutes here. Um, wireless Land vendors traditionally have been really crappy at showing, giving you any kind of DFS visibility. So here's a little plug for my company, uh, Extreme, in our cloud management solution. Formerly, uh, the cloud management solution, formerly known as Hive Manager, is now called Extreme Cloud IQ. And uh, we now provide visibility um, in the cloud for DFS. Um, most vendors, the only way you can get it is from the log files with our APs. Uh, we can now, up to 30 days, give you a visual, show you DFS events, and the channel change in, in a timeline view of up to 30 days, and we provide that right there in the cloud view. Uh, additionally, we can show you different views um, all the way at the AP level as well, so, so, and so you can not just go in that timeline view for your entire network, but at individual uh, AP, um, uh, <coughs> various APs, like your top five APs with DFS events. Yes? Do you have the ability to correlate uh, to see if we have a, a false positive by same site, same side of the building, one got a DFS, the other same channel didn't? Not yet. But hang tight. Okay, um, not yet, um, because that kind of goes in the discussion like two slides. And then finally, we can show you this at the individual level. So you can see uh, a boatload of events here, and the reason we have a boatload of events, I was doing that in my house, the same AP over and over, okay? And ideally, you would only want to see maybe one or two false positives a week, okay? If you're seeing more than that, you got a problem, which brings me to kind of to this discussion. Um, you know, I know machine learning and AI are overused buzzwords, okay? But it is where everybody's headed. And so one of the things I'm encouraging my own company is to take uh, uh, a lot of looks into correlating uh, how they can correlate DFS information, including maybe fa false positive information and maybe uh, using that. Think about this. Maybe uh, we have a huge customer base and maybe there was a customer down the street that was always getting DFS alerts um, and they were real, they were not false, but then uh, this hotel Hotel decided to buy extreme APs. Well, maybe uh, based on the knowledge learned from the cloud, when the hotel puts up extreme APs, it just says, yeah, don't even bother with channel 100 because we've already learned this. And so that's the kind of things that machine learning and AI and false positives too, I hope we'll be doing things like that in the future. So I have a lot of high hopes. Uh, 802.11k is also important, especially with voice over Wi-Fi devices. So with voice over Wi-Fi devices, they can't probe. Um, so if if they're going to be able to roam, um, they're going to need to know about uh, neighbors that they could potentially roam to, and 802.11k will help uh, with DFS and roaming quite a bit, especially for voice over Wi-Fi. A couple of resources right here. There's a white paper that I referenced um, for um, that gives you all the different regulations. Nigel has a really good blog. Also, Adrian, who worked with Nigel on another good blog. I encourage you to download both the Etsy and FCC documentation as well. 
um, but that's where most of, um, I got most of this information and, and just from research. Um, quickly, I've been preaching about Wi-Fi 6 for the last year and a half. Um, I encourage everybody to see the presentation this afternoon on 802.11ax that Francois and Rowan are giving. I'm looking very, um, uh, Raul are giving, I'm looking very forward to that as well. And the clients are finally here. They're finally starting to come into the marketplace. I also want to thank Nuts About Nets and also that goofy guy right there because uh, we did a lot of the testing together uh, over several weeks period. And then we have a call to action. And the call to action is the DFS project, okay? And we want you guys to participate on this. Um, and think about, and this is basically my last slide here, is think about the things you could do. Does my AP detect a DFS event? So what types of it? What channels do my APs move to? When does my, ch uh, what channels do they move to and, and where do they go? Uh, here's, a, um, how do they use channel switch announcements? My favorite one is this one right here. If a DF event happens, how does it affect the application performance of my devices? That's a really good use case of using this tool. Um, and, um, you know, does my AP return to the original channel and how long it should be for 30 minutes? And um, so, uh, that's it, guys. Um, once again, the call to action is to participate in this. Uh, you'll be able to upload PCAPs to this, uh, just like Mike's site, and share information. And I hope you enjoyed the demo, and that's it. So.